it's, a, it's always a pleasure to come here and, and visit Cambridge. Um, so I'm going to talk about the topology and the classification of matter. I subtitled it, New Physics Hidden in Plain Sight, for reasons that will become clear as we go along. And I'm going to take a little bit of a detour into some other cool stuff, some of which is related and some of which is unrelated. Most of the talk is going to be very understandable, I hope, for everyone, no matter what your level. Um, some of the detour into other cool stuff will be slightly higher level, and I apologize if I lose anyone along the way, but I'm going to try not to lose anyone. So here we go. The place we're going to start is with Mendeleev's periodic table. Um, this actually wasn't the very first version of the periodic table Mendeleev wrote. Uh, and he wrote the first uh, version in 1869, and this version was about 1872. He had a couple of errors in the original table, and things got shuffled around a little bit. Um, but what he noticed, and what he used to construct the periodic table, is he simply listed the elements in order of their increasing atomic weight. Hydrogen, lithium, beryllium, so forth and so on. And he found that if he put them in columns like this, all the elements in the first column would have the same chemistry, all the uh, elements in the second uh, column have the same chemistry, and, and so forth. And this one sort of classification of the elements into these different columns is the most fundamental principle we have in all of chemistry. This is sort of what defines chemistry for most people who study chemistry. Um, interestingly, Mendeleev never won a Nobel Prize, even though he was um, eligible many, many times. This was because uh, his arch enemy, Serge Arrhenius, prevented, had a lot of influence over the Swedish Academy and prevented him from ever winning. But that's a bit of a different story. Anyway, the, um, the idea of classifying things that you find in nature is not unique to physics or chemistry. It was occurred in, in many, many fields, even in the 1800s. For example, in, in biology, they tried to construct uh, a tree of all of the different organisms that you find in nature. Now, um, the, the even, before, I mean, even before Darwin, people were trying to classify all the animals, and then after Darwin, people were trying to figure out which animals evolved from which other animals. But there's something uh, different about the way that physicists try to classify things, and it was pointed out by Ernest Rutherford, who was the head of the Cavendish lab here for many, many years, I won a Nobel Prize in, in 1908. And what he said was that all science is either physics or stamp collecting. You've probably heard this before. And what he meant by this is that the way physicists classify things is somehow superior to the way other people classify things. Maybe mathematicians fit in the same category. But the way we do it is extremely precise, and other fields are not as precise. Now, Rutherford uh, must have been really annoyed because his Nobel Prize was awarded in, in chemistry, actually. And uh, to make up for it, he got his face on a lot of stamps later in life. So what is it that, that uh, Ernest Rutherford actually meant by this? Well, if you, if you look at the classification of animals, for example, suppose someone comes along and says, well, I discovered uh, a new organism, a new animal. Then you have to put it on the, on the tree somewhere, perhaps somewhere here. And you have no way of knowing if there aren't lots of other animals that you haven't discovered that you might have to put on the tree at some, some later time. You have no way of knowing if your classification is complete. Um, now, even to Mendeleev, uh, there was a lot of, that he didn't know if it was complete or not. Now, he would have known some things. For example, here's the element silicon, and right next to it is the element phosphorus. And he knew, or he suspected, there was no element between silicon and phosphorus, because if there were, he would have to push phosphorus over to the next column, then phosphorus would be under oxygen, and the chemistry of phosphorus is not the same as the chemistry of oxygen, and he would know that something had gone wrong. However, there's no way that he would have known that maybe he might have missed an entire column of the periodic table. In fact, he did miss an entire column of the periodic table. No one had discovered the noble gases yet, and then we had to insert another column of helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon at the end. In fact, he wouldn't have known if you missed an entire row of the periodic table. It could be possible that there's a whole set of elements between fluorine and sodium, and just pushing everything down one row, and he wouldn't have any way of knowing. Now, a person came along, this guy Henry Mosley, who changed stamp collecting into, into physics. He put the periodic table on a very mathematical basis. Now, this guy was a real genius, and you probably haven't heard much about him, because he died extremely young and didn't have a chance to, to really blossom into the great scientist he might have been. Um, he was made a, a professor at Oxford 
at um, you know, very young, age uh, of 25. Uh, in 1913, he did some brilliant work and then died in World War I at age 27. Um, Isaac Asimov, the great science fiction writer, says that his, de his death was the most costly single death of the war. Robert Milligan, fam famous for the oil drop experiment, said that his death alone was reason to call the war the most hideous crime in all history. So what was it that, that Mosley did that put um, uh, mathematics on top of the stamp, stamp collecting? What he did is, is he invented an x-ray technique which measures the number of protons in an atom. Why is that important? Well, because it puts the elements in undisputable correspondence with the positive integers. So this is now taking mathematics and putting it on top of what you've discovered in nature. So here's the periodic table the way we know it now. We have hydrogen, and helium, and lithium, and beryllium. And each one is labeled by their atomic number, which is the number of protons the atom has. And we know for certain that we will never discover an element between lithium and beryllium because there's no integer between 3 and 4. And no one can argue with the fact that there is no integer between 3 and 4. And so Mosley was very quickly able to determine where there were gaps in the periodic table. So in his day, all these things I've shaded blue had not yet been discovered. Many of the heavy ones were not discovered because people hadn't discovered any of the heavy elements. But there were some holes, like technetium at 43, and hafnium at 72, and rhenium at 75. These had not been discovered, and he knew immediately that they were missing because he found a number, something with 42 protons and something with 44, but nothing with 43 protons. So he was able to predict all of these elements uh, at one time. He also fixed some problems in the periodic table. There's a little bit of an anomaly, cobalt and nickel. It turns out that cobalt, although it has fewer protons than nickel, it has more neutrons and it ends up being heavier than nickel. So people had had, the, had cobalt on the other side of nickel previously and Mosley fixed that problem, putting them in the proper order. So, um, it's been a bit of a dream of, of scientists for a long time to come up with a periodic table of, of everything. Everything you can imagine, not just the elements, but a periodic table of everything. We want to classify and categorize everything that you can think of. So, all matter, we want to organize the same way we organize uh, the periodic table of the elements in undisputable one-to-one -one correspondence with some mathematical principle that you cannot argue with later. So forget, you know, if you want to think about the theory of everything, we, people sometimes say that the string theory is the theory of everything. That's not the theory of everything. This is the theory of everything. If you can have a theory of all matter, all substances that you can ever make out of all the atoms in the periodic table, this would really be the theory of everything. Now, what do we mean by all matter? Well, we can start asking what kind of matter can we have when we start putting together different atoms. Well, we can have crystals, we can have liquids, we can have amorphous solids, we can have liquid crystals, polymers, we can have quasi-crystals, gases, and so forth. And this is before we start putting these things together to have more complicated matter like, like cats and, and your mobile phone. I think if anyone recognizes this, this is the Galaxy Note 9, which actually isn't a stable form of matter. That's a, that's a joke. Okay, never mind. Um, so, how many types of matter might we actually have? Well, there's about 100 chemical elements that we can, we can work with. And the uh, American Chemical Society lists in their chemical abstract service uh, over 30 million different chemical compounds that have been studied so far. And the question is, is that all there are? Well, in fact, there's probably an infinite number of possibilities of the, chemi of the different chemical compounds you can put together. And that's before you even start forming mixtures, alloys, and solutions. And then, of course, you can put those together to form even more complicated things like cats. It seems that there's more possibilities than there are atoms in the entire universe. So what are we going to do? Well, we'd like to have some guiding principles as to how we want to classify our matter. And the dominant guiding principle that we've used for the last century is the principle of symmetry, which was emphasized by the great scientist Lev Landau, who told us that really symmetry determines many, many of the properties of the matter, so we should look first at the symmetries. So here's an example of an obvious symmetry. This is a, a depiction of a sodium chloride crystal, and it has an obvious symmetry that if you rotate the crystal by 90 degrees, you'll get back exactly the same the same thing. Now, this seems pretty simple, 
but it turns out that any material that has this property, this uh, invariance under 90 degree rotation, will have many, many of the same properties as sodium chloride has. So it's, it seems sensible to put them all in the same category. But there are some uh, less obvious symmetries, which are harder to describe, and one of them uh, we call time reversal symmetry. Now this sounds like something out of a science fiction movie, um, but it's actually uh, something <coughs> rather natural. So here we have a picture of a particle, and imagine it's moving around in a clockwise circle. This, if we run the movie backwards, in other words, we reverse the direction of time, it's now going around in a counterclockwise circle. And these two things are not equivalent. It's different going around one direction than it is the other. However, suppose we had two identical particles, and we let them go around in opposite direction circles. If we did that, and um, then took the movie and played it back in the reverse direction, it would look exactly the same. So two particles going in opposite directions is in rounding circles is actually time reversal invariant, while as one particle going around in a circle is not time reversal invariant. Now it turns out in most materials you have just as many particles going one way as you have going the other way, so you have something that is time reversal invariant. In fact, the exception to this is if you have magnetism, because you know very well that if you have magnetism, charged particles curve in only one direction, but they don't curve in the other direction. However, if you don't have magnetism in your material, you probably have time reversal invariance. So, so it's something that's very, very common in, in many materials around you, and we'd like to use that as one of the symmetries that we classify our materials by. There's a story about a great physicist by the name of Ettore Majorana, who was one of the pioneers of understanding time reversal symmetry. Now, um, Majorana, um, he was a little bit of a crazy character. He actually got in, it's, the legend is he got in trouble with the mafia and he was bumped off by them and his body was discarded. Anyway, any, what, is, what, is known, what, is, what is known for certain is that he disappeared at age 37 and was never seen again. Um, but before he disappeared and was never seen again, one day he was driving his motorcycle around and he was thinking about time reversal invariants and he gets in a crash and the, the police and the ambulance come over and they ask him, you know, what was he doing that he got in a crash? And he said, I, well, I was thinking about time reversal and so they decided he must have hit his head really hard and they took him direct, directly to the hospital. So, well, that was supposed to be funny. Anyways, anyways <laughs> true story. Um, so anyway, the, the, in addition to uh, time reversal symmetry, there's the other symmetries. One is known as charge conjugation symmetry, called C. And charge conjugation symmetry is even more hard to think about. It's basically replacing all positive charges in the material with negative charges. So, for example, if all your electrons turn into positrons. Now, this is something that seems very unnatural. You can't imagine a situation where this actually occurs. But it turns out that superconductors have this charge uh, conjugation symmetry. Um, so, if we we're thinking about superconductors, we want to include this charge conjugation symmetry. So, is this really all there is? We just look at the symmetries of a material, and this is how we're going to classify the materials. And for many, many years, people thought that, yes, this is really how you should classify materials, and this is all there is. But, in fact, recently we've realized that there's another guiding principle we should be using, uh, which is topology. And this is what earned the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2016 to these, to these three people all uh, British by birth, and all of them living in the United States right now. Um, and you can ask your funding agencies why it is that that happens to be the case. Um, anyway, I'm going to talk mainly about the work of, of David, David Thales, who, shared, who is uh, half of the prize. So, what is this topology? Well, first I have to define what topology is. Topology is concerned with the properties of space that are preserved under continuous deformations such as stretching and bending, but not tearing or gluing. So the, the classic picture that uh, people tend to use is um, the picture of a donut turning continuously into a coffee cup. Um, this can be done without tearing or gluing anything, completely continuous deformation, so topologically the coffee cup and the donut are, are equivalent. However, if you imagine trying to deform a donut into a, a sphere, or a sphere into a donut, you have to do something discontinuous, like gluing or tearing. So let's uh, uh, do an example of this. We, I'm going to claim you can't deform from a sphere to a, a torus, a solid torus, without encountering 
some discontinuity or a singularity. So how do I deform from a sphere to a torus? Well, at first you take your sphere and you might squash it like this until it looks kind of like an egg. Then you're going to press it down in one place here until it's very thin, and at some point you puncture it here. That's a singularity. You just tore through to make a hole. But once you have the hole, you can continuously open up the hole until it looks like this. But to get from the sphere to the torus, you have to punch a hole. You have to do something discontinuous and make a singularity. So we say that the sphere and the torus are not topologically equivalent. Similarly, if I want to get from a one-handled torus to a two-handled torus, or vice versa, I have to do something singular. So for example, I can take a two-handled torus, I can start squeezing down one of the legs like this until I get to the singularity where I split these two apart, and then I can contract the legs, and eventually it becomes a one-handled torus. But any way I try to do it, to get from this picture to this picture, I need to go through a singularity. So how is this going to help us in classifying types of matter? Well, so let me remind you something about types of matter. We'll start with something that I'm sure everyone knows, that atoms have energy levels that get filled with electrons. You remember from chemistry, 1s shell, 2s shell, and so forth and so on. Well, um, um, materials made of many atoms also have energy levels that get filled with electrons. So the horizontal axis here is some sort of position, either real position or some sort of position in abstract momentum space. Now in this, position, in this picture, we filled up all the energy levels to about here, what we call the Fermi energy in, in solid state physics. And then above this, we have a lot of empty states here. Now, if we have a situation where the empty space states are very close to the filled states, what we have is an electrical conductor. And the reason it's an electrical conductor is because if we apply a very small perturbation, such as an electric field, we can excite a particle out of its filled state into one of the empty states up here, expending very little energy, and then it can move around, there it goes, through the empty states from one place to another and carry current. Arbitrarily small energies will allow you to move an electron from one orbital to another, hence you have conduction. On the other hand, if you have a picture like this, where we fill up a whole bunch of states, and then you have a gap to the first empty state, then this thing is an insulator. And the reason it's an, it's an insulator is because you have to put in a large amount of energy in order to get an electron to move at all, and without that energy, everything is stuck in place. Everyone is still with me? This all looks familiar? Yeah, okay, good. Um, so we're going to study only insulators because they're simpler, but it will... Uh, give you an idea of the kind of techniques we're going to use to classify matter. Okay, so the thing we're going to do is we're going to think about deformations of the insulator on the microscopic scale. Now, despite the fact that I'm showing you this really fancy movie, which, you should, which probably makes you think about having some material made of clay, and I'm squeezing the clay and changing its shape, that's not what I'm thinking about when I'm talking about deformations of the insulator. What I'm actually thinking about is deforming the microscopic theory, changing the microscopic theory of the universe that I'm working with um, to get from one theory to another theory. To get from one material to another, I'm going to change the rules a bit by bit or continuously. Okay? So let me try to talk a little bit about what kind of deformations I can do to the microscopic theory. Uh, for those of you who have learned about Hamiltonians, what I'm doing is I'm changing the microscopic Hamiltonian. Okay? So, deformations that I could do. Well, for example, I could change the pressure on the electrons in the system. I could squeeze the system down, and that action of squeezing the system down will maybe put the atoms closer together. It will change the amount of hopping I have between electrons from one atom to the next, change overlaps of orbitals, and it will change the properties of, of the material. And there's lots of things that I could do in the laboratory. I could add strain, I could apply electric fields, I could add magnetic fields. I could do all sorts of things, change the gravitational field. All these things I could actually do in a laboratory. But I'd like to be more liberal than that, and I'd like to imagine things that I could actually never do in a laboratory. So an example of this is, you know, we, we all know the Coulomb interaction here, Q, Q prime over 4 pi epsilon naught r, what attracts electrons to the nucleus. But I can imagine, suppose I wrote down in my microscopic theory uh, a, a change to Coulomb's law, q q prime over 4 pi epsilon times r to the alpha, where alpha is not 1. Just change Coulomb's law. I'm going to repeal Coulomb's law and change it. Um, now, I can't actually do this in a laboratory, but it's perfectly well defined 
I could try to you know, solve the hydrogen atom in this different, um, you know, with this different attraction to the nucleus and, and see what happens. So this is the kind of deformation of the microscopic theory that I'm thinking about, something that I couldn't actually really do in reality. And then I could do some, some more liberal things, change the mass of the electrons and the protons and the neutrons, change the speed of light. Any deformation I could possibly think of is going to be allowed. Okay? Good? Yes? Not happy with it. You're happy with it? Okay. It's just humorous. It's humorous. Okay. Well, we're going to stick with it because it's going to be very useful. Okay? All right. Um, so anyway, um, the same way that the idea of topology is that to deform from one, um, to one something that is, has one topology to something that has another topology, I have to deform through a singularity. So to get from here to here, I have to deform uh, to a singularity. If two things, I can deform from one to the other without getting to a singularity, then I say they're topologically equivalent. And if I can't deform between two things without going through a singularity, I say they're topologically inequivalent. We're going to do the same thing here. We're going to, de we're going to deform the rules of nature, and I'm going to ask, do I have to go through a singularity to get from A to B? So what do we mean by a singularity? A singularity is a metal. So I'm thinking about only insulators, I'm classifying my insulators, and a singularity is going through a metal. So when the gap to excitation closes, then I say um, I've made a transition between topologies. Okay? So let me do an example here. So here's my initial insulator, and then I'm going to deform the theory like this. The energy levels move all around because I'm changing the microscopic Hamiltonian. And then I get to some final theory. And the final theory might be perfectly physical again. I change to some other physical theory. But getting there, I can go through some things that are not physical. But I got from here to there, and I did so without ever closing the gap. So those two are topologically equivalent. Okay? Those are the same top topological class. On the other hand, if I deform my theory, and I go from this to this, now all of a sudden I've closed the gap, and I've hit a singularity. If I can form two things into each other without closing the gap, then they're topologically equivalent. If I can't, then they're topologically inequivalent. This is going to be my classification scheme. Okay. Um, if it becomes a metal, that's a singularity. Okay. So this goes back to 1982. When David Thales realized that in two dimensions, all the topological classes you can write down for insulators are indexed by a single integer n. Okay. You can assign each of them an integer n. And well, first of all, why was he thinking about two dimensions? Well, we do have actually two-dimensional materials. Um, two-dimensional graphene is probably the most famous example now. It's a completely two-dimensional layer of carbon. We didn't have that in 1982. It wasn't discovered until after 2000. Um, but what we did have is we had two-dimensional layers of, of electrons. It's a semiconductor heterostructure. You have electrons basically trapped between these two layers, and they run around only in those two dimensions. And he was actually thinking about the physics of those electrons running around in those two dimensions. Now, it's a little bit of an artificial situation, um, referring only to these two-dimensional electron layers. But nonetheless, that was what he was thinking about, and that's what got him started uh, along this line of reasoning. So we want to index our, integer, index our insulators by an integer n. So n is going to be analogous to a number of handles. And I, I won't explain this right now, but uh, maybe at the very end, if there's, if there's time left, there's going to be a, a fairly precise mapping that turns a wave function into a topological object. And you can indicate which topological phase of matter you're, um, you're thinking about by which, um, you know, how many handles this uh, topological object has. So to, uh, to deform from one to the other, you must deform through a metal state or a singularity. Okay, so the regular insulators, the ones that we're familiar with, are indexed by n equals zero or zero handles, and these things are new insulators, which have n not equal to zero. So what are these n equal, not equal to zero insulators? Well, to find them, we have to look at this experiment here. It's a fairly uh, standard experiment for materials. You, you know, imagine running a current through it one way and measure a voltage perpendicular to it, or vice versa, apply a voltage perpendicular this way and measure the current that way. And what was discovered by this guy in two-dimensional samples is Klaus von Klitzing. He was actually at Oxford in 1979, 
And then he left Oxford in 1980 and discovered this fabulous thing. We should have kept him one year longer, I suppose. Um, won a Nobel Prize just a couple of years later for it. He's known as a quantized Hall effect, and what he discovered is in these two-dimensional systems, the Hall conductance, it, the longitudinal conductance be, becomes zero, becomes an insulator, in other words, there's no dissipation in the system, no low energy excitations, and the Hall conductance, the ratio between the current and the voltage, is quantized in units, integer units, the same index n here, times e squared over h, e is the charge of the electron, and h is Planck's constant. And this quantization, um, is extremely, extremely precise. Um, if you do this experiment, independent of the particular shape of the sample or what sample you're using or um, you know, where you put the contacts, you measure this constant e squared over h precise to about a part in 10 to the 11th. That's um, like measuring the distance from here to California to within about a millimeter. So it's, it's astronomical how good the, uh, the precision of this exper experiment is, and it's because of this sort of topological distinction between the states. Everything is indexed by an integer, and integers are precise. Now, I'm going to actually prove this statement later at the end of the talk, but first I want to give the overall picture of what this classification is about, then I'll come back and, and give a proof of, of this uh, Hall quantization that in these two-dimensional systems that the ratio between current and voltage is given by n e squared over h, and that allows you to um, classify all the possible insulators you have just by the index n. Okay? Everyone still with me? Yeah? No? No? Say yes. Please say yes. Okay, good. All right. Um, all right. So a little bit of a Gedanken experiment here, using these different insulators. What I'm going to do here in this pic particular picture is I'm going to imagine I have a, a two-dimensional system, and I'm going to change the physics of the system as I go from left to right. It might be something that you could actually do in a lab, like you could change the pressure as you go from left to right, or something like that. And over here, I imagine it's the n equals zero typical insulator, and here's the n equals one insulator, and here's the n equals two insulator. And in order to get from n equals zero to n equals one, I have to go through a metal. So there's a metallic boundary between n equals zero and n equals one, and between n equals one and n equals two. And there's a little bit of a trick here that the vacuum out here is n equals zero also. And the reason we know it's n equals zero is because on the boundary of n equals zero, there's no metallic strip. Therefore, it must also be n equals zero out here on the outside of the system. So the edge of n equals one is entirely metallic, and the edge of n equals two is entirely metallic as well. Okay. And in fact, it's these metallic strips that are responsible for the quantized Hall conductance. All right. Um, so the moral of this is that all insulators insulate in the bulk, but the n not equal to zero insulators, the non-trivial insulators, conduct along the edges. So is this all there is? Just this one index, this one integer index that indexes um, topology of things in two dimensions, the uh, quantized Hall conductance. Well, for a very long time, actually, that's all people did with topology. They didn't realize that this principle was more general. And there's a reason why they didn't realize it, because it seems to not work the same way in three dimensions. People had to jump ahead to 2004, and people realized that you had to combine the ideas of topology with the ideas of symmetry. So the general idea is if a system has some particular symmetry, we now want to consider all deformations of the theory that also preserve the symmetry, as well as um, you know, not going through a singularity. So, we have the, so now we're going to imagine deforming the theory, the microscopic theory of a system, but we want to preserve the particular symmetry that the system has while doing it. So the main example is insisting on time reversal symmetry because there are many, many systems that have no magnetism. So we want to preserve the no magnetism even as we deform the microscopic theory. And it turns out in two dimensions there's exactly two classes of insulators. There's the normal insulators which have no edge states, and then we have what's known as quantum spin hall insulators, and these have metallic counter-propagating edge states with an edge conductance of 2 e squared over h. And this has been observed in experiments in two-dimensional mercury telluride semiconductor layers. Um, but then people realized, in fact, you can do the same thing in three dimensions. In three dimensions, there's exactly two classes of, of insulators. You have the normal insulators with time reversal, or you have what we now call topological insulators, which have a protective surface conductance. 
So again, if I have two things in the normal insulator class, it means I can deform the microscopic theory in order to get from one to the other without ever closing the gap and becoming metal. But I can't get from a topological insulator to a normal insulator without going through a metal. Anything, any two topological insulators I can get from one to the other by deforming the microscopic theory without closing the gap. Okay, so what materials are these that have these properties? Well, these are the first few to be confirmed in the experiment. But this list was made a couple of years ago. Probably by now there's a hundred more. Um, and these are not unusual materials. They're on every chemist's shelf. Um, a lot of them are used in you know, industrial processes. Some of them are in your refrigerator. Some of them are in your cell phones and so forth. They're used all the time. They're very common. Um, but no one ever noticed they were different before. The differences are subtle. But they're there. They have surface conduction. They have certain magnetoelectric effects. They have certain properties on their surfaces um, that the other insulators do not have. It's kind of interesting. This, this sort of surface conduction is, is a, a very weird thing. You have this material with conduction on the surface, and it's insulating the bulk. And you might say, well, let me try cutting it in half. You cut it in half, and you open it up, and you discover that the new surface is conducting. And no matter how many times you cut it, it's always insulating the middle and always conducting on the surface. A very odd property. Um, so no one ever noticed this before, but it turns out to be true. Now, who discovered this? These guys. Um, so uh, this is three different groups. This one is at University of Pennsylvania. These guys were in California. And this guy was at Champaign-Urbana. So who were they? Well, these guys were already very famous physicists at the time, um, very well established. This guy over here was a graduate student working with these guys. By this time, he's pretty famous too. This guy was the poor, lowly grad student working by himself and being told by his supervisor to do something more useful. So the supervisor wasn't very nice to him and, and told him that what he was working on was, was really going nowhere and he should really stop doing it. But in fact, he, he was very confident of himself and he said, no, I really know what I'm doing. And he um, actually got to the, same, the right result at pretty much the same time as these guys did. We recruited him to Oxford as a postdoc a couple years later and now he's faculty at UCLA, so it worked out okay for him. But the moral of the story is if you're really sure of yourself, you can ignore your supervisor. Okay, so this is the periodic table of insulators that people have cooked up now. And over, so it looks a little comp complicated, so let me walk you through it. So there's three different types of symmetry over here, a time reversal, charge conjugation, and some combination of the two. And zero means it doesn't have the symmetry, and one or minus one means it does have the symmetry. Um, and over here in the right-hand side, it tells you if you're thinking about one-dimensional systems, two-dimensional systems, or three-dimensional systems. And z means it's indexed by an integer. z means integers. z2 means there's two possibilities, either trivial or non-trivial, two, two cases only. And these are the cases that I've already discussed. The two-dimensional system with no symmetries whatsoever, in, indexed by an integer, the quantized Hall conduction. Or the two-dimensional or three-dimensional systems with time reversal symmetry. These are the so-called topological insulators and the quantum spin Hall insulators. Um, so these are the ones that we've discussed so far, but it turns out once you, have, once you know what to look for and once you're making this connection to mathematics, you realize there are lots of other, there are lots of these other materials that have non-trivial properties as well. You can start looking for them. You realize that helium 3B superfluid is this one. This one is strontium's ruthenate superconductor. This one is polyacetylene. This one is indium arsenide uh, superconducting wires. And many of the others are things people are looking for. Now, similar to uh, Mosley saying, there's a hole in my periodic table. Technetium should be there. In fact, it's the same thing we're doing now. We're saying, oh, no one's observed this before. Let's go looking for it and see what properties it has. So is that all there is? Is that the whole periodic table now? Well, no, you can be much more complicated. You can add additional symmetries. So the only symmetry we considered so far is time reversal symmetry. But we can consider more complicated symmetries. So for example, a crystal reflection symmetry. If you just have a single plane of reflection in your crystal, it changes the classification story. Now, I'm not going to walk through this entire table, but there are many different classes, different dimensions, and you have many, many different uh, so-called crystalline topological insulators you can go looking for, and you can start asking what are their properties, and are they different, and have we found them before, or are they new? Um, then we can move on and use some of the same topological principles to start classifying metals and other materials.
So this is the basic idea of the periodic table of everything and the idea of classifying and organizing all the matter. Now obviously we're very far away from the point where we can classify and organize cats, but we've made an enormous amount of progress in uh, classifying things like insulators, things like metals, semi-metals, and um, other things that we like to study as, as physicists. And we've learned an awful lot from doing it because we found um, we found a lot of, of, lot of materials with new properties that we didn't expect, and now we know where to look for them and what properties um, they're supposed to have. Okay, so this is the first part of the talk, and the second part of the talk is going to be aiming to prove this one statement, that the Hall conductance is quantized in, uh, in, in the integer units of e squared over h, so I'm going to prove that in two dimensions, the topological classes of insulators are indexed by a single integer n. But before doing that, I want to prove some, I want to discuss some other cool stuff. And the reason I'm discussing this other cool stuff is because I need to introduce some ideas in order to do this proof. And the, the ideas are so cool by themselves that we should sort of dwell on them for a moment and emphasize how great they are, uh, because they are kind of neat and take some other detours. And hopefully, um, this gets a little bit more complicated, but hopefully people will be able to follow this as well. So the first cool thing, cool stuff part one, is known as the Aharonov-Bohm effect, which should be called the ehrenberg sidde effect. It was discovered by Ehrenberg and Sidde in 1949 in London and Edinburgh, respectively. And then it was rediscovered by Aharonov and Bohm in 1959 in Bristol. Now, Ehrenberg and Sidde noticed this effect, and they said, hey, this is pretty cool. And then Aharonov and Bohm discovered it again 10 years ago, 10 years later, having not read the paper by Ehrenberg and Sidde. And they said, hey, this is really cool, but they said it really, really loudly. And that's why they got the name attached to the effect, and, and Ehrenberg and Sidde didn't. So they made a lot of noise about this, and they emphasized that it really, really is something strange. So let me explain what the effect is. We start with the, you know, the Young's two-slit uh, interference experiment, which I'm sure everyone has studied before. You have some particle beam, or could be a photon beam, but let's imagine it's a beam of electrons. Um, and it hits two slits here, a wall with two holes in it, and we get an interference pattern when we look at it on the screen over here. And the reason for the interference pattern is that the, the, a, a, part, a wave can take two routes, can go through this one, or it can go through this one. Those path lengths can be different, so we'll get an amplitude or an absolute value of the amplitude, which is uh, either the 2 pi i times the length of path 1, over the wavelength, or either the 2 pi i, the length of path 2, divided by uh, the wavelength. Um, and these two terms can add either constructively or destructively. So everyone's familiar with this, yes? You know how to derive this? Okay, good. So now I'm going to change the rules, okay? I'm going to change the rules. I'm going to um, make the particles have charge Q, and I'm going to add a magnetic field inside this wall here. The magnetic field is going to be completely hidden from the particles. The particles will never experience the magnetic field because it's completely inside this penetrable wall. Nonetheless, the interference pattern changes. This is really weird. <coughs> the particles that never experience the magnetic field, and yet the interference pattern changes. In fact, the way it changes is that the relative phase between these two terms gets shifted by IQ over H bar. Q is the charge, H bar is Planck's constant, times the magnetic flux enclosed inside the wall. Okay, have people seen this before? Some, some people have seen it? Okay, good. Um, so the reason for this, so why does this occur? The reason this occurs is because the physical thing that couples to the electric charge in quantum mechanics is the vector potential, A, B is uh, curl of A, rather than the magnetic field itself, and even if the magnetic field is confined to this region, the vector potential extends out and to infinity. Okay? <coughs> so the, the particles experience the vector potential. Now, and, and this is what Aharonov and Bohm said, this is really, really weird, it makes, it makes us think differently about the vector potential. Um, one thing to notice here is that this, is, this expression up here is, you know, 2 pi periodic. If you put in for the flux 2 pi h bar over q, which we'll call the flux quantum phi naught, then it's exactly the same as having zero flux. So as we add flux inside this wall, as we add magnetic field, when we get up to a flux of phi naught, to phi h bar over q, it's exactly as if there was zero magnetic field in there. Okay, so it's periodic in the magnetic field. When you get up to one flux quantum, you get exactly the same interference pattern as you started with, with zero flux quantum. 
So this flux quantum hidden in here is completely unobservable. Okay, cool stuff part two, the Dirac monopole. This is a rather beautiful paper written by Dirac in 1931, um, which seems to indicate that he totally understood the harnoff mohm effect, even back as far as, as 1931, although he didn't put it in this language and he didn't jump up and down and say, hey, this is really cool. But he derived something that was even cooler. So let's imagine that we have a solenoid uh, with, a with a magnetic flux going through the solenoid. As imagine it's infinitely long. Okay? If we do an interference experiment around this solenoid, we'll measure the flux inside, but if it's a flux quantum inside, it will be unobservable. We won't see the magnetic field. Now, um, let's squeeze the uh, solenoid down till it's very, very, very thin, like this, okay? Infinitely thin solenoid like this. If you have a fractional flux going through that solenoid, you can see it in an interference experiment. You send a beam of electrons, and the two, you know, the two partial waves on either side of this long string here will interfere with each other, it will see that flux, but if there's a flux quantum going through here, it's as if there's zero flux in there, okay? Now why is that interesting? The reason that's interesting is because we can imagine having an end to this, well, this is called the Dirac string, this infinitely thin solenoid. You can imagine having an end to this um, Dirac string, and it looks like a magnetic monopole. Flux comes out, and you couldn't even detect, in no experiment whatsoever can you detect that there's flux running through that string, as long as you put in an integer number of flux quanta, and there's no way to measure that it's there. Okay? The strict condition that Dirac derived is that the monopole flux times the particle charge that you're measuring with is 2 pi h bar times an integer. Now, there's several ways to interpret this equation. One way is that we know how big the particle charge is. Particle charges are, you know, <coughs> an integer multiple of the electron charge. So we know how big monopole charges are. So if we ever find a monopole, we know exactly how big it's going to be. But there's another way of thinking about this equation. If we ever find a monopole, a single monopole in our universe, then we have to have a quantized electronic charge. Okay? So a single monopole in the universe will force all particles in the universe, all charged, electrically charged particles in the universe, to have a multiple of a single electron charge. Okay? And this gives you a reason why it is that we should have quantized electrical charge, which we do observe in the universe. Now, there's a number of grand unified theories, you know, extensions of the standard model, which predict quantized charge, and all those theories also have monopoles in them. So it's very closely related. This was predicted by, by Dirac a very long time ago. Okay. So let me move on to cool stuff part three. This is the, the Byers-Yang theorem. So Yang is C.N. Yang, a very famous physicist who won a Nobel Prize in 1959 for the prediction of parity violation in weak decays. Um, and Nina Byers was a professor um, actually, she, was, comes from, she came from Somerville College, my college at, at Oxford, and for a very, very long time she was in superposition between Somerville College at Oxford and California, where she was at Stanford for a while, and she was at UCLA for a while, and eventually her superposed wave function collapsed, and she ended up in California, although um, later in life she, she told me personally that she really felt this was the biggest mistake of her life, that she should have stayed in England. It's so much nicer here in England. Um, Anyway, she passed away a couple of years ago, um, so you'll have to believe me when I said that. You can't ask her herself. Um, anyway, so it's really a stronger firm with a hard enough bomb effect, and the statement is the following. If you have a material like this with a hole in it, the ground state, and actually all the excited states as well, is completely un unchanged under the addition of an integer number of these elementary flux quanta through the hole. It's an extension of the statement that a flux quantum or an integer number of flux quanta is completely unobservable. Okay? All right. So we're going to use this theorem in order to prove the quantization of the Hall conduction. So the proof of this now, and I'm going to do it in one slide. Um, we want to prove that the Hall conduction of a uh, two-dimensional system is quantized in units of e squared over h. Okay. So we're going to, we're going to start with the two-dimensional... This is a... a, a um, an argument that goes back to Laughlin in 1982, immediately after the discovery of the quantum Hall effect by Klaus von Klitzing. 
Um, so then we have our two-dimensional system, a ring like this, with a hole in the middle, and we're going to put electrical contacts on the inside and the outside, and we're going to try to see if current will run from the inside to the outside. So there's a reservoir out here and a reservoir here, and we're going to see how much current runs from one to the other. So this sort of greenish thing here, this uh, annulus, is a two-dimensional insulator, and it has no low-energy excitations. Since it has no low-energy excitations, we expect that there should be no energy dissipation. You can't make any excitations at all, so you can't dissipate energy. What this means is that there should be no J dot E. There can be no current flowing in the same direction as the electric field because J dot E is the power dissipated. We don't want to be able to dissipate any power okay, into an insulator because there's no low-energy excitation, so we can't uh, make such dissipation. Okay, so what we're going to do in this experiment is we're going to imagine a magnetic flux through the through the hole, and the magnetic flux is going to be a function of time. And we're going to change the magnetic flux as a function of time, and we know what that does. By Faraday's law, it creates an EMF going around in the uh, azimuthal direction, and we know how much the, the EBMF is, it's just d phi dt, minus sign. Um, and then this uh, electric field is going to create a Hall conduction in the direction perpendicular to drive a current from the inside to the outside. Okay, and the, uh, the current that flows is going to be the Hall conduction, GH, times the EMF. Okay, everyone still with me? Yeah? Okay, now you might say, well, wait a second, isn't this an insulator? Does that mean you can't have current flowing? Well, it's not quite that simple, because we're microscopically changing the theory by putting a flux through the middle. We're guaranteed that nothing changes if you put an integer flux in the middle, but on your way, you have a non-integer flux in the middle, so it changes the theory. And when you change the theory, you move orbitals around. And the movement of the orbitals can give you current. Okay? So we can get a non-zero current. Um, we can get a non-zero current, but because we're not allowed to make excitations, we can't have any J dot E. The current has to flow only perpendicular to the EMF. Okay? All right. So now we're going to find out how much total charge moves from the inside to the outside. Well, that's easy enough to do. The total charge is the integral over time of the current. The current is given by the Hall conduction times the EMF. The EMF is given by d phi dt, and now we have d phi dt integrated over t, so we do that integral and we just get minus the Hall conduction times the change in the flux. Okay? So the charge that's move is minus the Hall conduction times the change in the flux. Now we use the byers yang theorem. We're going to change the flux by exactly one flux quantum. We change by one flux quantum, and we're guaranteed that the final state and the initial state are the same, because we start in the ground state, and we're guaranteed, and we do everything adiabatically, so we should end in the ground state, and we're guaranteed that the ground state after ending the flux is exactly the same as the ground state before ending the flux. So we should get back to exactly where we started, and that means, you might think, well, that means you can't have changed, you can't have moved any charge at all if you have to get back to exactly where you started. But you can still get, this entire system could be back in exactly the same state it started, and you might have transferred some electrons from the outer reservoir to the inner reservoir. Okay? So you're allowed to transfer electrons from the inner reservoir to the outer reservoir and leave this entire system still in the same ground state you started with. So the amount of charge you move is some integer number of electrons. There's the n that we want. So now all we have to do is take delta Q, plug in n times E over here, plug in 2 pi h bar over E over here, and put those together. We get the Hall conduction is delta Q over, over delta phi, and that is n E squared over h, and we have our proof. Okay? So as long as we don't close the gap, we have a quantized um, integer number of E squared over h in our Hall conductor. And that allows us to classify all insulators, all systems where with a filled band and a gap and an empty band, everything we call an insulator in two dimensions has a quantized Hall conduction as, as uh, advertised here. Okay, a few seconds left. Let me say just a couple more words about this. So there's this beautiful topological, this is sort of on a different subject, and this, I should have written cool thing number four up on top. Um, so this beautiful topological theorem by Gauss and Bonnet known as the gauss bonnet theorem, um, which tells you that the integral over a surface of the curvature at the point on the surface is 4 pi times 1 minus the number of handles on the surface. 
So the curvature is defined if you go to one point on the surface and you inscribe circles on, you know, on the curvature of the surface. There's a maximum, sur a maximum radius circle that you can inscribe and a minimum radius circle you can inscribe and the product of those two, one of the product of those two is known as the Gaussian curvature. And if you just integrate that all around the surface, you get 4 pi times 1 minus 1 over handles. If you think about something of uniform curvature like a sphere, it's obvious you're going to get the right result because the integral over a sphere of 1 over r squared is going to give you 4 pi and there's no handles. But if you take this sphere and you dent it, and you punch it so it has a dent in it, some places will have a higher curvature, some places will have a lower curvature, but the higher curvature and the lower curvature will cancel, and you'll still get exactly the same 4 pi. If you do it with a torus, you'll get 0. If you do it with a two-handled torus, you get minus 4 pi, and so on. Okay? Beautiful theorem. So, the Hall conductance can be rephrased as something extremely similar, which is the integral over, of a curvature over all k. So, you integral, well, it's actually all of k in a Brillouin zone, if you know what a Brillouin zone is, and this so-called Berry curvature is a property of the wave functions at that k in the Brillouin zone. If you integrate this over the Brillouin zone, it gives you uh, n, which is basically the number of handles times um, e, squ well, e squared over h that is out front. And it's the same thing, that you can deform the theory any way you like. You can deform it, make the curvature greater in some places and lesser in other places, but the integral over all k remains the same. Okay, so it's, a, it's the analog of the uh, Gauss-Bonnet theorem, which I'm not going to describe. One other way that you can describe what this, what this topological uh, story is about is to um, think of topology as um, a statement about mappings between two different spaces. So if I have a mapping between theta, you know, if I have a function phi of theta, where theta is an angle around a, a circle and phi is an angle around a circle, um, you can classify such functions by their so-called winding number. In other words, if I take theta around in a circle, and come back to where I started, how many times does phi go around the circle? Does it go around at all? Does it go around exactly once when phi goes around? Does it go around twice and so forth? And these are topologically different and they can't be smoothly deformed into each other. So topology classifies these mappings from one space to another. For insulators, you have a wave vector k in the Brillouin zone, and it gets mapped to a wave function psi of k, and the generalized winding number is exactly this integral over this Berry curvature. So it's again the Hall conduction. So that's a, sort of another way of understanding why this is a topological property. Okay, I think I should I should stop there. The periodic table of everything. So I think what's, what's different here is that Einstein is not distributing a periodic table when he's thinking of a periodic table with maybe a for lunch. Okay, I'll stop there and, and take any questions and thank you for your attention.